my pleasure to introduce you to Studio KOS, standing for Kids of Survival. Great. Uh, I don't know if the four of you want to take a quick minute to each introduce yourselves, um, just so that the Attorney General has like a little bit of background and can put a face to a name. Sure. So uh, you know, I can start. So my name is Angel Abreu. Uh, I've been working with Tim Rollins and KOS, uh, an art collaborative in the South Bronx for over 30 years now. Uh, Tim unfortunately passed away a few years ago. And so we started the second iteration of KOS, uh, called ourselves Studio KOS. And uh, we're so grateful that you've decided, especially in the infancy of what we've been doing uh, in the last last year, that you've decided to, to, uh, to add to to uh, the, the initiative. And so we're so grateful to have the Walker and, and Art Resources Transfer facilitate all this. And uh, thank you so much. Likewise, man, thank you. Thank you for having me. Hi, Keith, uh, my name is Robert Branch and I've uh, hey, you know, uh, been a member of KOS since I was 16 years old and I, had a, when I joined, I had a full Afro. <laughs> it's been a pleasure to be dedicated to this kind of work and working with making art within community and this kind of social practice. And it's a pleasure to make your virtual acquaintance. Well, it's a, the pleasure's all mine, thank you. Hey, uh, yeah, my name is uh, uh, Jorge Abreu. I'm, uh, I'm, I'm Angel's uh, brother. Um, I've been a part of Studio KOS or Tim Rollins of KOS since I was about 12 years old. Um, joined awesome. at a young age. Um, it's, it, it's, this has just been a mind-blowing, life-altering uh, experience. And, uh, and, and yeah, we, we thank you for, uh, for, for your acquaintance. It's very much appreciated. Well, likewise, um, uh, anybody else? Yes, Hi. we have one more. <laughs> Hi, Mr. Attorney General. My name is uh, Rick Savignon. Save the best for last, I guess. <laughs> That's right. Good to meet you, Rick. <laughs> nice to meet you. I've been part of uh, Tomorrow's KOS for the past over 30 years now. And um, like, like Robert, I did have a full set of hair as well uh, when I joined. But... Uh, as Angel mentioned, Tim had passed away a couple of years ago, and so we're uh, the members that are left. We're continuing the legacy to combine art and and literature together as a teaching platform to uh, yeah. to help students, you know, who 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 are looking for some kind of guidance or just looking for a push, an edge. And I just wanted to thank you so much for adding on to our cause, and 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 I'm hopefully that. At the end of this conversation, we'll be adding to yours as well. Yeah, I, I took the afros, Mr. Attorney General, if you don't notice. I, I took the afros. <laughs> well, I hope you guys will call me Keith. Uh, please feel free to do that. I, I, um, I'm not a formal sort of guy, and um, I just really regard it as an honor to be with y'all. I can tell you that, um, to me, uh, so look, I'm an elected public official and a lawyer, and I am very well aware that there's nothing that I can really say uh, more effectively uh, than an artist can say it. If you want to think about, if you want to conceptualize the 60s, how are you going to do that without thinking about Marvin Gaye, right? If you want to tell a story about the 1920 Tulsa riot, I'm going to tell you right now, um, the Watchmen did it better than I ever could. <laughs> if you want to talk about um, you know, green, you know, about uh, sundown counties. You got to turn on Lovecraft country, right? And, and what about the art of Jacob Lawrence? And what about, I mean, so what I'm saying to you is I have a deep and abiding respect for arts. I'm no artist, um, but, you know, uh, I'm kind of an amateur guitar player and cello player. And uh, my kids are artists. My son is an artist. My daughter works in the art world. And so I have a big regard for it, uh, even though I don't do it, but just please know that uh, I'm, I'm looking forward to a wonderful conversation. So thank you all. And, and let's not uh, stand on the formalities. Um, you know, are you guys all four in New York? Yes, we're in the region. I'm in the Bronx and uh, the guys are in the sur in surrounding yeah. communities near, I'm, near, near, near I'm, in, I'm in Brooklyn. Um, but I grew up in uh, Washington Heights, uh, uptown in Manhattan. That's Upper Manhattan. And I'm, I'm and Angel and uh, Jorge. Are you guys uh, Dominican Amer Dominican Americans? 
Yes. Yes. Actually, 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 actually we, we, all, we all are. We all are. Now, yes. I was going to yeah. guess you were Haitian. Oh, so, really? You know? uh, well, yeah. I, I, well I'm, yeah, because Dominican and Haiti are very close to each other. Well, so, so I believe, I, yeah, I, f I found that a relative traveled from Paris to Dominican Republic and actually stayed there. So. Oh, yeah. Oh, sorry, and Robert, I just figured you're one of our historic brothers from the U.S., right? <laughs> I, I, I'm very proud. Uh, I, I am very proud to be, a, um, uh, to be uh, I, uh, recognized as African-American, but my parents are both from Dominican Republic. And so, oh, uh, wow. Uh, okay. <laughs> so it's, you know, but we are, uh, my grandfather is from St. Lucia and, you know, very proud to be part of the Black diaspora. Um, uh, yeah. And, and it's one of those things that um, it's really wonderful when we're looking at uh, the works of people like Ellison, because it's just, I come to it with this kind of different, you know, this, you know, these different set of eyes. Um, I don't take it for granted because, you know, these, these um, uh, in the places where my parents come from, this, uh, you know, writing, and this kind of criticism is wasn't we didn't have free speech, so it's you know it's really part it's really wonderful to come in and kind of you know uh, uh, study his likes and I was one you know I, as you know uh, Keith we were doing these series of workshops around Ralph Ellison's Invisible Man and we found that you know these novels really speak to today's America and, and we just wanted to know what is your connection to the work of Ralph Ellison uh, other than you know sharing a, a beautiful last name. Well, according to my father, who's 91 years young, right? Uh, we have some distant relation with Ralph Ellison. I don't, I don't really have any proof of that. One day I should really dig into that, but that's what uh, my pop says. I also, you know, I, when every, I think everybody has an awakening when it comes to uh, political understanding. And um, reading Invisible Man to me was, uh, was sort of like a, a breakout moment. I was a teenager and I read this book and I was, I was always uh, just amazed by, by the book itself and uh, just, you know, really identified with it very, very um, closely because, I mean, there, there is this idea when you're black of feeling invisible, right? Walking into a store People ignore you until you are the focal point of their attention, right? And so I, uh, I, I think the, the book is one of those, you know, central pieces of American letters that no matter what color you may happen to be, if you want to understand American historic and social dynamics, you got to read Invisible Man. Well, I mean, that's, that's actually, I mean, it's so well said. Keith, and, and if I may, I'm having a hard time calling you Keith. Uh, I Please, totally got get with it. The more you do it, the easier it gets. <laughs> it. Uh, but, you know, and obviously with your daughter working at the Walker, um, uh, I, I wanted to know, I mean, part of, part of the, the scope of, this, of these workshops that we're conducting with the Walker in conjunction with our resources transfer is to emphasize the pedagogy that Studio KOS with Tim Rollins developed years ago using literature and education as a medium for making art. Um, you've kind of answered this question a little bit, but I want, I want you to go further on how art and literacy may have influenced your development, your career, uh, your life in whatever way. Well, I could tell you, um, my dad is a mad fan of Dizzy Gillespie, Charlie Parker, Miles Davis. He's a mad fan of Coltrane, Ornette Coleman. Look, I don't know nothing about these guys. I just know that when I was a little kid, that's what he had on, right? And um, he was into it, you know, and he wasn't just into the music of it. He was into the style of it. And it was always, you know, if you look at like, if you just grab Miles Davis, he sort of embodied sort of a new post-World War II spirit of what it meant to be a black man. Okay, he's from the lower caste, if you will allow that reference. And yet he's defiant and unapologetic about it. And like, hey man, I'm here, dude. I can blow this horn and I'm not making no excuses and nor am I making no apologies for being who I am and what I am. And that's how my dad is till right now. And he raised all five, four of me and my brothers. 
unfortunately, we don't have any sisters. We got five boys. But then, but you know, so, so that was a formative experience. My mom, on the other hand, rural Louisiana, and she liked her some B.B. King. She liked some Mahalia. She liked all of that kind of art form that we associate with agricultural workers of African descent from the South, right? So that was, that's how she uh, uh, responded, right? So you had, this, you had this bebop guy from Detroit and this um, blues uh, girl from Louisiana, and they kind of came together. And isn't that, you know, isn't that the experience, right? And so my mother also, she was really into sacred music. She liked gospel music. And that's another important part of who we are and what we are. My mother was also deep into the culinary arts. She's one of those people who believes that, you know, pralines and gumbo and etouffee is a sacred creation, right? And she uh, and Amira could tell you that, I mean, my daughter Amira can whip up some gumbo like anybody, but as well as anybody because of her grandmother, right? And Amira was not born in Cane River, Louisiana. She was born in uh, Minneapolis, Minnesota. So the thing is, is that these, these are things that are gifts to share over. If I could elaborate a little bit even more, I mean, literature was big for me because, as I said, you know, not just reading The Invisible Man, which was huge, but also reading Black Boy by Richard Wright, also huge. Also Man, Child, in the Promised Land, Claude Young, uh, Brown, also huge for me. And then also, you know, uh, the, the writing of, um, of James Baldwin, you know? The, he has an anthology called The Price of the Ticket. You go through that thing, man, and everything is just blowing your mind. And then, you know, The Fire Next Time, short book, powerful though, right? Baldwin, insightful. And then, you know, so I just grew up like reading this stuff, you know, and hearing the music and it helped me understand the world. And so even though I did not grow up a poor kid, I know, I know that in the black community, it's, it's common for our people to struggle economically. My dad was a physician, so I'm I'm not gonna claim that that was my situation, but what I will say is that for all my family and relatives and neighbors, that I certainly witnessed that to be their situation, empathized with it, felt us close kinship to it and lived next door to it. And, and so that was my experience growing up in Detroit. And so when you deal with, when you deal with a lot of young uh, emotion, anger, frustration, confusion, is there any better way to address that than through the arts, the arts? You know, it's, it's, it's the arts are the things that you can dance. You can dance your way to an understanding. You can sing your way to a better understanding. You can poem your way to a better understanding. You can paint your way to a better understanding. And so, because I believe art is essential truth. People like me tell like detailed truth, facts, you know, statistics, all that stuff. People really don't think like that. People think artistically. People think about what are you trying to say? What are you making me feel? What, you know, it's an essential truth that the artist is going to tell. What or, gets to the heart of the matter? So, yeah. at least when you're, when you're looking in retrospect, right? When you can actually, through the prism of, of the, the artist's eye. I mean, you know, the one thing that, that struck me, Keith, if I may, is, is, is um, with literature that there's also this component of, of having people give you permission to actually uh, read these things in a weird way as a kid, right? Even if it's like, even if, it, even if these are things that, we're, that are not for us to be people of color, right? And that's one thing um, you mentioned, it's about transcendence. It's about, it's about uh, putting yourself in a, in a different world somehow. Right. I mean, you're, in a, you're stuck in a closet reading these things. And, you know, I, I look back to like W.E.B. Du Bois, who says in this book, and I remember reading it as a 13 year old in Souls of Black Folk. I sit oh, yeah. by another one. You know, and so, you know, I sit by Shakespeare. And he winces not like that means this stuff was written for us, too. And we can like look at the, these things through our experiences and interpret them in, in, a, in a different way. And I, I love I love first of all, I love the fact that you say mad. <laughs> that your your father loved mad jazz, which was crazy, which is fun, which is hilarious, um, and but I love that uh, like when you were talking about how your parents loved the culture 
um, of the black culture during the time and the jazz. It almost reminds us, and I, I, I think I can speak for the rest of the guys, it's we, our collaboration is almost kind of the same, where it's like we're jamming, everyone ha uh, knows an instrument, but they add on to the, to the, to the, to the music, to the song. And everyone's just looking at each other and corresponding with each other. And, and, and it makes me think back to when uh, I read somewhere that you said that, um, uh, that you, you think of community as community building as a group. It's an effort for all ages, you know? And, Absolutely. And, and, what, and when, it comes to, when it comes to building, then it, uh, folks who collaborate from all ages can gain some kind of advantage because every, everyone seems so dispersed at times, you know, because we put ourselves in these little groups and little categories. Well, I think what I hear you speaking to is this intergenerational uh, opportunity to a certain extent. And the intergenerational connection is very critical, right? First of all, it's how all of humanity learned anything. I mean, before we entered the industrial age, the way you learned how to cultivate corn or tobacco or cotton or whatever, the way you learn how to work metal or the way you learn how to make shoes was intergenerationally. Something about industrialization has broken the intergenerational chain but if we engage community in community, we can reignite that chain. Mm -hmm. And I'm gonna tell you, I think arts does the same thing. If there's one thing that connects people in a, intergenerationally, it is the art world, right? Because you know, even though Ralph Ellison and W.E.B. Du Bois and all those great authors we've been talking about have now gone on to their reward, you know, somebody a 24 year old like my daughter Amira can pick that book up and read it. Brand, like with, with fresh eyes, you know, that interation, intergenerational exchange is absolutely essential. And again, community, you know, really is impossible alone, right? Community is essentially a, it is an interactive uh, phenomenon. And so it brings us together. Have you noticed that in a country of 320 million people, People are more isolated and alone than ever. We are lacking in community. We are lacking in connection. People feel desperate and alone. Senior citizens, you know, I mean, you know, I talked to a lady just the other day. She told me, you know what, my son, you know, I'm so proud of him. He moved to San Diego, got married, his kids are there. And sometimes he, you know, he calls me as often as he can. I could hear that lady longing for community with her son, her caring kids, her family. Community is essential. We are essentially social animals. And we have got to rekindle that community every chance we get. What do you, so what do you think it'll, it'll take, Keith? I mean, because I, I hear what you're saying with community and we've never been more connected as a society as far as the amount of connections that we can make, but they're all kind of fake connections. They're not they're not real and, and, and we can hide behind anonymity in some weird and strange way. Well, you know, in many ways, we're right at the beginning of this um, ultra connectivity that we're, we're dealing with right now. I mean, is well within my, I mean, look, I was an adult, a middle-aged person when Twitter hit the world. It is within my memory that we didn't even have cell phones. When I was a kid, we had three channels. ABC, NBC, CBS, and then the local affiliate. Now, you got more channels than you could possibly imagine. You know, you got more, wait, you got Facebook, and Facebook is like old people's technology now. I mean, you know, I mean, these kids are off on the TikTok and on the, I mean, all this stuff, right? So, I mean, my point is, we are at the foothills of this. And I think creative artists trying to solve the problem of isolation within the context of mass connectivity can maybe reconceive the moment and say, how do we use this to build real community? And what is the medium of it? Again, because, you know, there is something about create creativity and artistic expression, which does draw people together around the essentials, right? So, so again, we've been talking about race for a moment. You know, we've been kind of having this, 
you know, kind of black Latino kind of got silo dialogue. Well, what if we were to take up something like Huckleberry Finn? White author, you can, we can talk to everybody about that. You, the, everybody's included in that American conversation, all revolving around, you know, a book. And by the way, was, we, have, you know, we have a series of work when Tim was still alive on Huckleberry Finn, and boy, did right. we criticize for it. I mean, we just did. But you know what? But what is the artist for other than to be the center of criticism? I mean, if you want to be an artist and you don't want no criticism, get out of the business. Art is inherently controversial because what it does is it goes to essential truth. And the truth is some people benefit and exploit others based on the status quo. And the truth is they don't want to hear nothing about it. They want, they want to be able to suck profit and get privilege and everybody who's suffering as a result, shut your mouth and take it. That, right? Am I, come on now. Oh, you're absolutely right. Because does, Ex is, does Exxon Mobil want you complaining about climate change? Absolutely not. Shut your mouth and, you know, turn on the air conditioner. <laughs> you know, that's, right? uh, we'll buy some things and, uh, you know, talk to us later. Right. Here, that's uh, right. Keith. I wanted, I wanted to ask you, so Ralph Ellison once responded to a, to a question from, from an interviewer stating that too many books by Negro writers are addressed to a white audience. Uh, yeah. By doing this, the authors run the risk of limiting themselves to the audience's presumptions of what a Negro is or should be. Uh, the clue to this can be found in our folklore. Like, how does folklore play a role in your day-to-day, -day, in your progression uh, throughout your life and career? Can you speak to that? Well, well you know what, um, uh, Jorge, two, two things. First of all, it is probably a fair criticism of anybody from the lower caste who's a writer that they're trying to cater to the upper class, the dominant caste. That, that's probably a fair critique. And, and what, what gets you from being generic and average to great is that you somehow break out of the programming that the dominant society has imposed upon you and you start talking about your specific truth in a universal way. Why do we love Toni Morrison? Because she talks about her very specific subjective reality in a way that anybody can connect to. So she's not propagandizing and she's not engaging in a marketing campaign to sell a book. She is just saying, this is the deal, man, deal with it, you know? And so, you know, that, that's, so th that's the thing. And I mean, look, we do live in an economy where people need, if you're a writer, you gotta sell stories and who's gonna buy them except for people with money and who's that, right? So there is, th that, that is a fairly, that's a, that's a legitimate criticism, but you know, that's the struggle, right? How do you put forth an essential truth that is subjective, but at the same time universal. So that's that reality. Now, you know, the, the, yeah. Continue, no, please keep, continue. I didn't want, want to interrupt you there. Tell us about, keep oh. on that same thread. Yeah, so, so what I was gonna say, moving on from that topic is that, so like as the, as the artist of color, you know, you do need to sell an article or sell a book if you wanna keep doing it. Um, but you also got to understand that if you ever find yourself essentially pandering to the dominant class, you're watering down the authenticity of that product and making it less interesting. Well, Keith, I mean, I mean that's, that's a phenomenon that's, that's a commercial phenomenon that's happening right now. I mean, we know, we know artists that do that and that's unfortunate. Um, and, and they're and, but see, in, in defense of those artists, I mean, I mean, it sucks, right? But is it, if you're an artist, is it, can you really blame somebody too much for wanting to move out of their mother's basement? <laughs> you yeah, know, that is true, yeah. You know, can you blame them too much for wanting to say, look, I'm a writer, I am tired of bussing tables. You know what I mean? 
And so they, so they might alter their writing, but I, but I guess it's important to say you, that is going to come at a cost because you might sell, you might be, I mean, you, what you really don't want to become is a merchant of guilt relief, right? You don't want to be, so like, so like right now, a lot of black and brown artists are hot. You look on the bestseller list, everybody wants to read something about how to understand the George Floyd moment, right? And yet, the ones that will be most successful commercially even will be the ones that are the most honest and clear. I mean, you can't say that ta Coates is chasing uh, an honorarium or, you know, he's coming at you straight, he's coming straight at you and read it or don't, right? People ask him, well, what's your solution? He said, I ain't got none. That's not what mm -hmm. I do. You know, I, I tell you what's happening. You figure out what to do about it. And so, you know, that, that's sort of the moment. So I, what I would say to the, to, the, to the artist, the black, brown artist, the artist of color who's trying to make, you know, clear commentary is, you know, stick, stick with that authenticity because that's what people are craving right now. And by the way, who's to say that authenticity is not commercially viable? In fact, some of the most successful literature you'll ever see is stuff that People look good. People love it because it's keeping it real, you know. Yeah. So, but it's a, but it is a hard road, and I think it's important to acknowledge that reality. John John Lewis um, appraised you for your for your oration skills. He thought that you should be heading up the DNC because you have the way to kind of connect with people with the fiery intensity and energy. Talk a little bit about how you use because we, you know we sort of think of you as you're an artist as well. Even you you know within your own within your own platform. We know you're playing the guitar. That's part of that improv improvisational nature that you bring to your speaking, to your speaking. But tell us a little bit how you weave critique, honest critique into this in sort of message. Because you're not just saying what people want to hear, you know, the, your language can, it's, it's piercing sometimes. And why is that important? Well, well, first of all, I love to talk to people about public speaking. And the first thing I tell them is, go in a room, and ask yourself what this moment calls for you to say. And if it doesn't call for you to say anything, don't say anything. You know what? Whatever you say should be better than the silence, right? And if you don't have, don't yeah. talk to be talking. Talk to say what needs to be said and ask yourself what the moment calls for. So that's the first lesson in my, that's Keith Ellison's lesson number one in terms of public. Lesson number two, say never say more than three things. Never make more than three points if you're giving a speech. <laughs> two points is better than three points. And one is best of all. Respect the law of primacy and recency. People remember what you say first and last. And all the stuff in the middle is just examples. Number three, shut up before people want you to. <laughs> is there anything worse than having some politician blather on oh my god that's the very definition of boredom i you want know? to pick up on i want to pick up on what you said there because a lot of the uh the travails of the narrator in the invisible man come as a result of this public speaking about not kind of adopting and, and, and recognizing some of these rules. He gets himself into trouble and some adventures and we start to see some of the contours of American life and particularly some of the tensions that, we, that um, uh, someone has to balance when they're, when they're a person of color. Can you talk about um, how you navigated those, uh, the, those, those contours as the, first member, as the first Muslim member of Congress? Well, you know, I get myself I shoot my mouth off and get into trouble I mean, all the time and every day, you know? I mean, I, I'm not trying to, I really, I know my own heart and I can tell you, I'm not trying to hurt nobody's feelings. I'm not trying to put anybody down. I'm just trying to be honest with myself and say that. Now that will get you into trouble, right? That will get you into trouble because look, people every day want to do one thing, but be known as something else. Everybody's image, image conscious these days, and they want to know how do their numbers look, but they want to get away with all manner of things. I mean, look, you know, 
you know, I mean, you take, the, do you remember that story uh, about those uh, really upper, upper of those wealthy uh, uh, white families who are bribing uh, big colleges to get yeah. their kids in? Mm -hmm. Yes, mm -hmm. sir. I mean, I more than anything else, they were worried about their reputational risk. <laughs> you know what I mean? More than anything else, they could say, yeah, I'll go do 10 days in jail as long as nobody knows about it. So that, that's, the, that's the deal. So, be, so truth tellers are making themselves vulnerable. And if you make yourself vulnerable, then you can be taken out and be taken down. What I say is appreciate, you know, the, take a 360 view of what you're about to say. And if you believe it to be true, say it. Um, so I, I, I think that that is, is important. You know, it's, I mean, Martin Luther King at the end of his life, was not popular. I mean, you drive around any American city and you see MLK Boulevard and you see statues here and every Jan January we got breakfasts and I'm sure y'all been to a ton of them, right? When, he, when we lost Martin Luther King on April 4th, 1968, his public approval ratings were well below, were about 30%. And a lot of black folks was criticizing him too. But he yeah, had to say I what think, he had to say. I, I think what you mentioned is important. One, uh, you know, for us, because I, I think our, 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 our departed friend John Lewis would say that when you're talking, when you, the way you approach public speaking is to get into good trouble because you're coming from a pace yeah. of truth. And, and when we're, and when we're, you know, it's important to mention Martin's name because, you know, we borrow the iconography from our workshop and the visual painting that we're going to make is borrowed from those Memphis protests. And yeah. um, the placards that 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 those sanitation those lonely sanitation were very important. You know, Martin is always thought of as a you know kind of a highbrow public speaker for the intellectuals. That wasn't the, the reality of his life. But he put his life out on there for people who were on the bottom rung. Because if he couldn't do that, then he you know he really didn't have a leg, leg to stand on. So tell us a little bit about how you do that in your work. Well, what I can tell you is that Martin Luther King, Martin Luther King probably never would have been killed if he said nothing about Vietnam, and if he said nothing about economic uh, uh, injustice, if he just would have tried to tear down the vestiges of Southern Jim Crow, he might have survived that. But when he started talking about the very foundations of the uh, unjust economic and social order, that is when people were like, okay, you're line crossing now. You know, I, I, you know, the thing is, brother, I just do what I, I just do what I think I need to do. I, I don't even really have some grand plan about it. I am gifted with the, uh, with a lack of ambition. And what I mean by that is, I don't care if I ever go to the U.S. Senate. I don't care if I ever become governor. I didn't, you know, when, when I ran for Congress, I actually didn't expect to win. I was quite confident I was not going to win. So when I started running in 2006, I said, look, this, this, this Iraq war is premised on a lie. We need to get out, we need to get out now. I realized I was not running for valedictorian. I was not running for chief policy aide. I was running for Congress. And I was gonna channel what I believed and what most people I know believe. And I just put it out there and other folks who were supposed to beat me, they didn't. And those folks, I love those guys. I don't, I'm not here to crash on them and I'm not on no ego trip. I'm saying, but I would say that if, why did I beat them and why did, why did I become the first black person to represent Minnesota in Congress and the first Muslim? It's because my opponents were trying to figure out what people wanted to hear and then serve that to them, where I was just saying what I thought. Yeah, I love what you say about um, line crossing because we we uh, the group can relate to that because we we we've done that so many times where we've done shows especially like with uh, 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 black themes like Martin Luther King, Malcolm X, um, uh, uh, Huck Finn works. People would always ask us like, "Well, wow, these are really deep." Uh, uh, deep novels like uh, uh, and autobiographies like why are you doing this and I was like to 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 step over the line to cross the boundaries right. to join the forces right and so we started realizing that uh, the more we did it the, the more we became uh, role models for younger folks even to our own family members right 
So my question to you is as a role model, like what do, um, how would you, how could you speak to, to, to young folks who are struggling to hold on to their identity um, through conflict that they might encounter? You know, what I would say to them is that any artist that isn't crossing lines is essentially not an artist, they're a propagandist, right? They're, they're a politician. They're trying to push a line. They're a marketer, they should go into marketing because you might as well be trying to sell Coca-Colas at that point. So if you're not crossing lines, you're a, pro you're a propagandist. Mm -hmm. So be comfortable with the fact that you are going to afflict the comfortable and comfort the afflicted, <laughs> you know, all at the same time. That's one thing. Get comfortable within yourself with what you're doing. Two, as you criticize others, please criticize yourself. Self-reflection is essential mm -hmm. because all of us can be motivated by things that aren't, aren't good, right? All of us, I mean, look, we, we all want, I mean, we know about the primary needs of food, clothing, and shelter, but what about the secondary needs of recognition, acceptance, and approval? We all need those. Nobody you know does not need that. In fact, you show me... Even though you, you all, maybe you're blessed to have your grandmother or your mother. And this woman is selfless. She's always breaking her back to make other people happy. But when you recognize her on her birthday, boy, she can't stop smiling. Am I right? <laughs> That's the even truth. The most, That's absolutely. That's the even truth. the most morally <laughs> evolved person you know appreciates a kind word in recognition of what they've done. So what I'm saying is, you gotta, so because we're like that, we gotta check that impulse. We gotta say, am I motivated by ego? Am I trying to show up? Am I trying to, am I jealous? You know, am I kind of, we've, you know, it, one thing I'd say to young people is that always be your own critic. Now, after you've been your own critic, then you have to learn how to forgive yourself. You can't be worse on yourself than other people are, right? So yes, you tell the truth, you check yourself, and then after you've checked your own self, then you forgive yourself and get up and try it all over again. Persistence and the willingness to get up again is so essential. It's very hard to become great, a great writer. Very few people wake up and become that overnight. Yes, it's a gift, but it's also a lot of practice. You guys are writers. Am I right about that? Yeah, no, some, some yeah, of us. We are. <laughs> um, I mean, but, but we... my point is, it does take a lot of work, right? It does. All, I mean, no question good. about it. No, no question it all, about it. It all takes a lot of work, but you know, I wanted to. Uh, first off, I want to say, Keith, that uh, you're about the the, the most accomplished uh, uh, person that's been gifted with the lack of ambition that I've ever met. <laughs> so that's pretty amazing. Um, but what what I'd like to what I'd like to say is that, um, and I'd like to ask. If you could talk to young folk, especially in the at the heels of what's been going on this summer, and you know we, but about protests and civil disobedience, this actually is piggybacking on on the advice you were giving just now. But like, what's your? I mean, we we living it. We're living in a time now where we've gotta we've got to we have got to we have got to do something, and it actually takes community. It takes all of us. It's not just. Uh, um, it's not just adults. It's actually really, it, it, we, we're, we, you know, young folk are, are inheriting this world, as you know. Yep. Um, and so what, what kind of advice would you give in, in light of what's going on? Well, the one thing I would say advice-wise is where there's no struggle, there's no progress. You know, Frederick Douglass said that. And others before him said that, and others after him did that and said that. So I know that people criticize you because you're out there protesting. But the truth is, you, your protesting has created the opportunity for change. And if you didn't, it wouldn't. I mean, the Minnesota State Legislature just passed a massive police accountability bill. Is it perfect? No. Are young people satisfied with it? Absolutely no. The Minneapolis City Council is looking at, 
you know, uh, transforming public safety, you know, that's because of protests. I would say that um, you got to protest. I'd also say that we we'll never forget that the protest is to achieve something. You're not protesting to protest. You're protesting to change something. And that is essential to keep in mind because there is a certain amount of excitement that goes with protesting. There's a certain amount of sense of empowerment that goes with protesting. And it could get so um, alluring that you're protesting to be protesting, right? Now, I don't think young people are doing that, but I think it's something to watch out for. And I think you've always got to ask yourself, what are our goals? What are our tactics? What is our strategy? Goals, tactics, strategy. You've got to grind that, and you've got to do it every day. But and you, and you, you can protest for six months or a year or 10 years as long as that protest is getting you to your goal, right? And so those are, those are a few things that I would say, is, and I, and a few other things if you'd allow me. One, you've got to constantly be creative about how to reach out and engage more people. Don't ever allow yourself to be like, we are the vanguard and nobody understands us because we're just that damn woke. You know, no. If no people aren't showing up to support you, maybe you ain't doing it right. Maybe you're not on, maybe you're not on the right thing. Is the pressure, is the pressure, if I may, is, is it, I mean, as an elected official, just so people can understand, when people are out there actually protest, I mean, is this an effective way of it, what I'm, and what I'm hearing from you is that, yes, it, it, it can be, but with, the, with this paradigm shift that we've faced, especially with having to interact um, uh, digitally, is this an effective way of, of, of real change for making real change? In your opinion? Yes, it is. I think it is. And, and, and I think it, it is effective. I think it is helpful. And it gives people who are policymakers the ability to say, look, I know you guys who don't want to vote for this, don't want to vote for this. But I got 10,000 kids out there in the street demanding that we do this. I think that we need to just pass this. You know what I mean? You literally create a crisis in the state house, in the Congress, in the state legislature, in the city council that will result in a policy shift when you're out there. Understanding, but if that's what you're doing, maybe it makes sense to be in touch with one of your allies who's in there who's going to vote on this. To just say we don't talk to any politicians, maybe that's a mistake. Maybe you should do that. Maybe you should try to stay in touch, keep that linkage. Maybe you should understand that, you know what, um, you passing things is, is, is harder than you might guess, and your pressure is going to make it a little easier for your allies to get things done. Let me just, I really believe, and I'm, I'm, a, I'm an advocate of uh, Medicare for all. That means universal single payer health care for every American disconnected from your employment. If we, if when, if when, you, if when we were deb debating the Affordable Care Act, we had 40,000 people out there demanding it, we might have got it. And even if we didn't get it, we might have got something close to it. But once we don't have that public pressure, we're not going to get it. And same thing for climate issues, same, same thing on housing, same thing on education funding. You've got to have a mass movement that demands these things or you're simply not going to get them. Congress, state houses, they're not immoral, they're amoral. What does that mean? What's the difference? Immoral means they're bad intended. They're trying to do wrong. Amoral means they're indifferent to right and wrong. They'll do what they're pressured to do. And my point is, if you bring, there's a lot of people who like the status quo like it is. In order to change things, you've got to overcome the power of the status quo. That's not easy. And so you got to be determined. you got to stick to it. you got to be strategic. You have to communicate. And you have to invite more people in. You have to massify the movement and get more people in, find more ways to build the coalition. Hey, uh, hey Keith, so I want to just kind of switch directions a little bit. Um, uh, so Ralph Ellison believed that the search for identity is not only an American theme, it is the American theme. 
how have you uh, um, uh, remained grounded in your beliefs and who you are, uh, especially in the role uh, of attorney general in Minnesota? You got to stay close to the people. You got you to gotta, um, show up um, in people's lives. You need to sh be quiet and listen to that lady tell you that her son just died because he couldn't afford his insulin. You need to hold your tongue and let the emotion of that moment sit there. You've got to put yourself, you've got to go to those tent cities that you see all over America nowadays and ask those people, what's your situation? How did you end up sleeping in a tent in a park? What are you going to do when the winter comes? Do you have kids? Are you dealing with chemical dependency? What do you need? I mean, you know, you got to listen to that. And, and the people, they, they, I mean, I'm going to be very raw, you know, they don't have access to a, to, a, to a shower, so they might not be as clean as they would like to be. If you're freaked out by that, you ain't no public servant. If you, if, if you, they might not, they might not speak with perfect diction. If you need them to do, if you need them to speak in, you know, the King's English to express themselves in order to listen to them or you dismiss them, you're no public servant. You've got to get with the people and listen, you got to get out, you got to get out to that farm and listen to that dairy farmer who says, you know what, I can't make no money doing this but this is my grandfather's farm, my father's farm. Now it's my farm and I don't want to be the first one to lose it. And I, yes, I have thought about taking myself out because I am freaked out every night when I try to go to bed. This is the reality of people. And if you won't listen to it, you're no public servant. What do I do? My strategy is knowing that anybody can sell out, even me, what I try to do is stay close to people and listen to their stories, absorb their stories, allow their stories to bathe over me so that when I get up in the morning and I go do my thing as AG, I do it with those people in mind every day. That's, that's, a, we, we wanna, that's very powerful and we wanna pick up on that because part of what we're gonna be doing here with the Walker is working with public servants and teachers and librarians and getting them to understand their role in, in, in service and how to use story, other people's stories in service of, of in service of teaching and and expanding, um, uh, you talked you talked a little bit about uh, uh, being very, coming having that awakening very very young from from a from a from from a very powerful work of, of of text. Can you talk a little bit about how the awakening you've had in some of your art experiences as a musician and how they parallel each other? Well, you know, one thing, it's, it's one thing, you know, and my daughter can tell you this, and boy, do I love that kid, man. She's my, she's the apple of my eye, man. Um, it's one thing to be at home playing some tunes at home, and because your kids are forgiving. If you hit the wrong chord or you forget the next lyric, you know, your kids don't care, man. You know, you know they are, that's all right. But one thing, but when I got up in front of people and played in front of a crowd, even though I go in front of crowds every day and I actually don't experience anxiety when I go talk to large numbers of people, I just don't. I don't know why, I just don't. Because I've done it a lot. Um, when I had that guitar in my hand, boy, did I have the butterflies. You know what I mean? I really did. And it taught me, you got to put yourself in uncomfortable spaces. you got to put yourself in spaces where you are absolutely scared to death <laughs> and you know what even if you don't even if you don't do well even if it doesn't go great you know what there is there is a certain satisfaction having known that you did it and you tried and you did your best you know what i mean and so I, I would say that is the most one of the most important things that i have learned from art is that yes you know, for a non-artist to get into an art space, I'd say an amateur artist to get into a professional space is scary. But you know what? You are going to be so much better off, even if you fail, even if you forget the song, even if you, you know, sing off key, you're going to be better off having done it. You're going to, you're going to be like, I did that. You know, I might not do it again, but I did it. You know, and maybe you do well and you will be invited back. My point is, Figuring out how to figuring out how to get yourself in new uncomfortable spaces is very important. 
And for example, let's just say you're a white person and you're dealing with all this George Floyd stuff. And you're like, you know what? I've never really thought about race because I don't have to. I'm from the dominant class and everything kind of revolves around us. But I got friends, coworkers, maybe even family members who are telling me about this situation that has been around so long that I don't really even know about. My advice to you is go get yourself in an uncomfortable space. Get yourself in a space where it's like, wow, I never knew. Wow, you might criticize me or I might feel criticized even if you didn't criticize me. You know, you do that and you will learn something. You won't necessarily be upset you did it. You might be ready. You might say, I can do that again. I'm going to tell you this. If somebody invites me to play my guitar in front of a group, as long as I get enough days to practice, I'll do it again because, you know, I didn't die. <laughs> you know, I did it. It happened. It's over. I'm okay. What else? You know what I mean? So there you go. It's funny you talk about un uncomfortable spaces because uh, as, as a collective, we've been around for over 30 years. And my mom's only, my mother, who was very uncomfortable coming to our shows, has only been to maybe two of our shows. But the last show that she came to, it kind of changed her mindset of how she viewed art. You know, because yep. it, it, as kids, she would take us to museums, but never to galleries because she always felt uncomfortable. Like she, she felt like she didn't belong there. In got a sense. you, got you. And then she, and now she never, she always talks about that last experience as something that was very impactful for her. So I want to know, I know that your daughter works at the Walker. Um, was there a show or an, an, an artwork that uh, uh, in, in the present or in the past that actually impacted you um, and kind of, change your view of, of how how life is for you or 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 has it changed your political sense in some way yeah and and there have been many many moments along the way that i had that experience um i i can tell you that i i remember uh very well um having an experience um uh, at at a gallery where uh, I saw these pictures of Jacob Lawrence. Mm. And uh, I was a kid and I was thinking maybe, you know, maybe I, maybe I could be a lawyer. You know, I read a book about Thurgood Marshall uh, and, and I saw the picture of, of, of that Jacob Lawrence painted about that. And there was something about the, the dignity and the pride in that picture that he painted that had a profound impact on me. And I just thought to myself, I mean, that picture literally helped me think that I could do that or I wanted to do that. Now, it was also literature that helped me figure that out. You know, it was also, uh, but it was a painting too. And I just remember the Jacob Lawrence painting. My mother, who died from COVID only a few months ago, uh, Mayor's grandmother, um, actually spent about five bucks to get me the print of that, you know. And uh, I put, had it in my uh, room for years and years and years, and I have it in my home now. And, and it's so, I, I just, there, there is a seminal moment. And I believe in all, I believe that anybody who becomes a self-aware agent can probably trace that back to a moment in their life when they, um, they had something just turned on for them. And usually it's somebody else who showed it to them and exposed it to them. So, those, and, then, and then another thing is I remember my mom giving me a, a big, fat, thick volume of Baldwin called The Price of the Ticket. And I remember reading all that. So again, that's art too, right? So, uh, you know, uh, I remember in a, as a high school student reading Huckleberry Finn and the N-word was in there. And uh, my mom, her name's Clyda Ellison, Clyda Martinez. Uh, she, she flipped through it. And there's a point in that book when Huck says, when Huck's aunt says, what'd you do today? Oh, I went to the dock. Oh, what happened? There was an explosion. Oh, really? Did anybody get hurt? And he said, no. He said a couple of ends were killed. And then she said, oh, that's good because sometimes people do get hurt. Wow. You follow that? Yeah. Amazing. Follow that? So that, that is uh, Samuel Clemens telling us this is how this society regarded black life, mm. right? If you, if, and my mom showed me, my mom pointed that out to me. And I was 
for freaking out on that one word. And she was trying to say, this guy's trying to teach Americans, white Americans, about themselves. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I, yeah. I, had, I had a moment where um, we, we did some workshops in, in San Francisco, some prints, and the visiting artist there was John Cage. The composer. Oh yeah, and you know we. I didn't know much about him. I, I was a teenager, but later when he died, and I read the article in the Times, I realized that this person was such an influential uh, 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 entity in everyone's life in the arts, right? And yep. I saw a quote of his that said, "Don't be afraid to do. Uh, I'm not afraid of doing something new. I'm afraid of doing the same thing." You know, and that that struck me so much right and and i felt if i felt like it was uh it was one of those moments where i was like i i i was so glad to to actually have met this person you know well but to piggyback on what rick was saying i, I wanted to uh, as what you were talking about keith those seminal moments right and this is more addressed to the to the youth, and actually, really, I think all of us we need we need these pep talks sometimes. Um, but do you think that those moments? Do do we look at those in retrospect and recognize in retrospect how tremendous they can be? Or, or I mean, because I, I know I've had these thunderbolt moments, like you speak about, where you're just like, whoa! It just, oh my god! Like this is where I need to be. There's some. Uh, some sort of power that has put me in this position to be in this, in, to experience this. For those young folk, I mean, what, how can you realize that power of, of retrospection? Like how, you know, what does it take? Well, you know, um, I sort of believe that moments, those thunderbolt moments are like gravity. They're just, they're just there. And the question is, will you recognize them? Mm -hmm. So open up your mind and self-examine about what you're being taught at a given moment. Understand that you can learn a lot from failure, probably more, than fail more from failure than you can success. And then understand, too, that journaling can be an excellent practice for self-reflection. Because if you journal a lot, you can look back on them journals and you could say, wow, that's when I met Cage. And you know what? What I wrote in this journal before then and what I wrote after that is really different. He impacted me. You know, you could, you, so, so I think journaling as a, as a tool, because I think that one thing that, you know, you need to do is understand that being effective at what you do, whether it's an artist or anything, is not just sort of based all on talent and ability and innate gifts. Part of it is a craft which is something that you have to work at and perfect. And part of your process is that journaling. So let me just tell you, man, um, I got journals. Uh, hey, I my staff see. can tell you, I got stacks oh, of them. And I, and, I, and I go back in them. And do y'all journal? Yeah. I bet you, you do. Yeah, I, I do too. I have tons of small little journals. And every now and then I go back and I go, wow, how much I've grown. Right. You know? I mean, and and you, can, you can see your and, evolution. You know, I, <laughs> there it is. Absolutely. Right there. <laughs> and Keith, you know, we're the first time we came, uh, our project came to Minnesota. Minnesota was in 88, and we're doing we're part of an exhibition on Malcolm X. And in the iconography of that painting, um, uh, we, we, had, um, we took his letters and made this calligraphic form that was both his letters, but it was uh, also at the end was a scalpel, but it was also a pen. Because yeah. what we want to do is just sometimes you have to write about these painful experiences and you have to put them out there and I, uh, and so that people can, so we can kind of transgress our moment and, um, yeah. uh, and put these things on, uh, on wax, so to speak. So thank you so much for sharing that journaling experience because I think that's a really important part of any professional, of, of any professional um, uh, uh, practice. So are we, should we expect a book from you at some point too? Well, you know, I do have one book out there. It's called My Country Tis of Thee. It's out there. Right. Um, and, but I actually, I'm working on a few book projects now. I've just been so busy, you know. Um, uh, th there's a lot of things. I mean, one, one book I'm, I'm actually in the middle of writing now is how do we use politics to build community? 
Usually we use politics to just win the next election. But what if we said, no, we're not so much worried about the next election. We're worried about building a relationship with the people who we would represent. And if we looked at politics that way, we wouldn't just like come show up at sometime in October. And we wouldn't just look at it as a self-serving exercise. We would learn, look at it as a relationship building exercise because right nowadays you go to the Republican National Committee or the Democratic National Committee and most of the professionals are gonna say, if those people aren't voters, don't talk to them. Whereas what I, if, if, if we did this the way that I'm proposing, we would talk to people not because they're gonna vote for us, but because they're our fellow citizens and we have a responsibility to figure out what's on their mind. Now yes. to do that, you gotta start early. You can't start in the election year. But, but, but check it so out, that's Keith. That's one book I mean, that I'm working on now. But check it out, I mean, would it, would it be, I mean, I don't wanna to get too much in the, in the politics, but would it be about term limits? Because that's the thing. I think people are, they become these, these professional politicians and that's all they're interested in doing. Because I absolutely love what you're talking about with building, with po politicians building community. That's what I thought, that's what I thought the, it, it should be, right? That and might I would be jump part of it. Keep, yeah, that, you know, that the word politics comes from the, weak, from the Greek word polis, people. So you can't have real politics without people. And I, and I think that this, you know, and, and we, and I think, you know, in, in working with people and building community, even during this time where we're being brought to a standstill by this virus, when we can connect with people and then bring, and, you know, build common ideas, bring our, you know, bring our, 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 our authorities and, and, our, and, um, um, and our leadership to task. Then I think we're more we're more more powerful people and we're better people for it. Well, it's just to you establish. Know, Robert, Robert I agree one hundred percent. Sorry, go for it. To establish that social contract again between yeah. our leaders and our people, the polis, as 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 Robert says. I mean, that social contract is not there, and that 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 that, that name trust is just not there. There's always it's all about skepticism and what's in it for you, and it you know we need to break that down. Well, one thing we need to do is de-emphasize the importance of money in fundraising. We really do. Uh, we need to make it financially beneficial for a politician to talk to people who don't have very much money. And that means federal matching. That means that if you, that, you know, that, that there's a lot of things we can do, but, you know, the, the system's not structured the way it is by accident, <laughs> right? right? And so to have a massive change, you need a lot of people. I will say this, you know, because I think you guys noted that we are in this moment of COVID. And I think that it's important to point out that just because we have to physically distance doesn't mean we need to socially distance. And in fact, I think social distancing is a misnomer. And what we really should say is physical distancing because right now, so before this show, I didn't, you, you, we didn't know each other. Now I feel like I know all of you guys. Uh, and we have, um, We've met on, we've met virtually. Yeah. This is an opportunity. This is something that is a possibility for the future. It's kind of what, going back to this idea, I said we're only on the foothills of what it means to use social media. And we can use it for good if we insist upon it. It really is a question, of what are we gonna do with it? On the one hand, you can have somebody uh, using it to, to, to sell nonsense or manipulate people or the algorithms can be messed up, designed, whatever. Mm -hmm. Or you could say, you know what? This could be a tool to really connect people. And uh, I, I imagine at one time when the drum was a piece of technology, somebody might have used the drum to just make war. And then somebody else said, no, we're going to use the drum to make it to, 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 to dance. <laughs> you know what I mean? And so it really is a matter of how you are going to do it. How are you going to use what's in front of you? And I think that in this moment, there is creative energy needed to help people be close together despite the necessity of physical distancing. One of our maxims as an artist, is, as an art collective, is that everyone is an artist and yeah. everyone is welcome. Yeah. Well, that's, that's a good maxim. That's <laughs> it. I, my son, Jeremiah, likes to say that Artists are essentially creative problem solvers. You take an artist out of the, their medium, whether it's writing or painting or singing, and you put them in, say, like engineering, and that person's going to come up with new stuff because they're, 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 the artist is an artist. Art, the art's not in your finger. So if you 
you know, get into an accident and you can't paint anymore, you're still an artist. Because what an artist is, is a creative person. So, I don't know, wait, hey, it's been oh, an honor to be- we, we know about the, uh, the letter that Jeremiah wrote to the Walker uh, concerning Steve McQueen's uh, uh, film back in 2012. And uh, yeah. the change that he made through that. That's impressive. Well, let me tell you, you know, Jeremiah is the last kid I would have expected to be in politics. When I saw Jeremiah, he had dreadlocks down his back and he was up on scaffolding painting murals. That's what Jeremiah I knew. And so the fact that he said, I'm going into politics was somewhat of a surprise to me. But you know, if, you're, if you guys are parents, you know, you know, you, you know, we don't make them. They come out how they want, man. They, they are who they are, all on their own. It's impossible to like mold your kid. Your kid is, God bless your kid to be him or herself, period. Oh, you, you know, know they're, you born, they're born with that personality from, oh, yeah. from day one. We know That's that. Right. <laughs> That's right. Well, hey, well, it's been a real blessing to me to be with y'all, and I look forward to meeting y'all in person one day. I want to urge you to uh, just keep doing what you're doing and just pray for you guys to have tremendous success. Uh, well, and I'm just honored to be part of it. Thank, you know, the, 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 Attorney General Keith Ellison, I mean, we were so blessed to have met you virtually, and, and we, we, we second the thought. We really would love to meet you in person. Uh, we're so, just to, just to wrap up, I guess, we're at the end of our hour here. Um, uh, we just want to thank the Walker Art Center. Uh, thank Thanks, Walker. Our resources transfer. Um, everyone that, that, that uh, put, that helped in putting all of this together. We're, Studio KOS feels so blessed. Um, and I, I feel like through this, uh, this discourse, uh, you know, so we've forged a friendship here and uh, hopefully um, for other people that, that see this, that we don't know that they'll, they'll take something out of us. We, we feel pretty confident in that. So thank you so much. Yeah, thank you so thank much. You, thank you, Keith. Thanks. Thank you, Keith. Thanks. Take care, brothers. Be Take well. Care of Nissa, thank you, and thank the walker. I'm out. Okay. Take care.